for the problem for the coalition game, uh -huh. part B, the, the core, uh -huh. you just want us to write out the just the inequalities. expressions, yeah, inequality. Even for two players, it's not even. Right. It's right. infinite. Right, right, right. Players, yeah, know. yeah. That was, was just what Yeah, just the core, the set of inequalities. Uh, okay, so uh, today we will talk about polymatrix game. Uh, this is There is not a lot of work on polymatrix game, uh, maybe uh, 20 papers uh, on this topic. Uh, so this is really the uh, one of the areas of research in game theory where a lot of papers, recent papers have been written on this field. So what I'm going to review has been published in 2014 to 2016, okay, and so the applications to electrical engineering or to engineering as such, uh, we don't quite know what applications uh, are there, but certainly some of you might write some papers in the future about the uh, about some of the applications of polymatrix game and how you can improve some engineering systems using the idea of this particular field. So I want to motivate the discussion from three-person zero-sum game. Three person zero sum game. Okay, uh, this is a topic that we haven't yet touched upon in this class uh, because it's not very. Uh, I mean, it's like you know we have talked about three person or multi person n person non zero sum <coughs> game, uh, but three person zero sum game was one of the first generalization of zero sum game. It was actually considered in von Neumann's book in 1944, uh, and the idea is as follows: you have uh, you have matrix A uh, of player one, and then A two, and then A three. So there are three players. Uh, but these are not two-dimensional matrices, these are three-dimensional matrices, okay, because you have three, three set of actions. So let me write it as i, j, k, i, j, k, and i, j, k. You add them all up and they are equal to zero, okay, so that's a three-person zero-sum game. Now we know from uh, many assignments and in general we have implemented these algorithms over this class. If you have two person zero sum game, you can write a linear program and that gives you the Nash equilibrium or saddle point equilibrium of that game. But unfortunately, three person zero sum game is, is as hard, in, in order to solve or find a Nash equilibrium of three person zero sum game, this problem is as hard as finding a Nash equilibrium of two person non zero sum game. So why is that? Why would finding a Nash equilibrium of this game, uh, why, is it more, why is it as difficult as finding an equilibrium of two person non-zero sum game? Any thoughts? Why would that be true? Yeah. We might try to divide the problem to find the Nash equilibrium, considering the first and second pairs. Right. This is a non-zero sum game, and then we solve the other problem. Actually, let me let me reverse that ordering. Let's say God came to Earth and gave you the Nash equilibrium of player three. Okay, so you know player three's Nash equilibrium exactly. Uh, you have to find the Nash equilibrium of pair, player one and player two, right? And that amounts to finding an, a Nash equilibrium of a non-zero sum game, two player non-zero sum game, right? So even if you knew the Nash equilibrium of the third player, you still have to find an equilibrium of a non-zero sum game, therefore the problem is as hard as, uh, as, hard as finding an equilibrium of a non-zero sum game, two player non-zero sum game, right? And we know from our experience that finding an equilibrium of two person non-zero sum game is a fairly difficult, uh, fairly difficult uh, problem unless you have far more structure on the game, like the rank is much smaller than, uh, than the number of actions and so on. Uh, okay, so you can have n person zero sum game or n person non zero sum game, and it is very difficult to find Nash equilibrium. Okay, very 
difficult to find Nash equilibrium in general. Okay, but we do want to understand how how to uh, but but we want to figure out uh, or rather we want to consider a model which is not which still is n person game okay but it doesn't feature payoffs of this format okay so what's the setting here what's the setting of poly matrix game <coughs> I have a graph something like this so I label the players 1 2 3 4 so I have a V set of uh, players they are the nodes of this graph and E it's the set of edges Okay. And uh, you could have cases, for instance, 3 and 4 are not connected. Okay. 3 and 4 are not connected. So there is no edge between them. Uh, so in this particular case, each of these pairs that have an edge, they are playing a non zero sum game among themselves. Okay. So I'll define A, I, J is the payoff matrix payoff matrix of player i or you can also call it node i with along the edge along the edge connecting to player j Okay, assuming that ij is part of the edge. Okay, so let me give you an application or rather a, a, an idea of what really it feels like. So I have a network of four computers and they are connected in this fashion. Uh, each player has a set of antivirus software that it can apply or it can install on its computer right and so player 1 can install one specific antivirus software player 3 can install some other antivirus software <coughs> and based on how they what softwares they install this network might get immune to certain kind of attacks certain kind of virus propagation which might give some payoff to the players okay so okay so if everyone if everyone installs the same antivirus software then they get immune to they, then they get immune to certain kind of attacks certain kind of virus propagation but then some virus some other viruses whose definitions are not there as part of the antivirus software installed that can start getting propagated within this network okay so that's probably a very naive example of where this kind of uh, uh, this kind of structure would make sense the other applications that people have uh, written on in their papers, but certainly I, uh, I don't know many applications, serious applications of this model, where nodes interact pairwise, which is what you see. So there's a pairwise interaction between player i and j, and so player i gets a payoff of a i j. Uh, it's a matrix, by the way. A i j is a matrix in R M m i cross m j okay so m i is the number of actions with player i m j is the number of actions of player j okay uh, it also uh, can be mod can be used as a model to uh, find out how a network of agents are going to adopt different technology and how their payoff is going to look like if they adopt uh, certain technology or if they are going to interact in a certain fashion, how their payoff is going to look like, uh, depending upon who connects to whom. Okay, so there is pairwise interaction. So the key feature here is pairwise 
interaction. Okay, and contrast this. Oh, you know here i, j, k are not player index. They are, you know what, let me put this in the, in the superscript. So you know that i and j are player indices. So these i, j, k are action indices. This i, j is player indices. Okay, uh, sorry about the confusion. Okay, but the key feature here is there is pairwise interaction among the agents. So what's the payoff of individual players? So the total payoff of player i is uh, ui pi p minus i is equal to summation i j part of the edge set pi transpose a i j p j okay so that's uh, the total payoff Okay, so each player, i, gets the expected payoff from every other player. So player 3 is going to pick an action P3 or rather a mixed strategy P3. Player 2 will pick a mixed strategy P2. So what player 1 will pick, P, Pi, it will find the expected payoff along this edge, expected payoff along this edge and just add it up. Okay, that's the total payoff of player i. So what do we want? We want to find a Nash equilibrium. So a Nash equilibrium would be uh, ui pi star p minus i star is greater than or equal to for all i and pi in delta mi. What are the various classes of such games? One is a obvious zero sum, which means that sum of ui i in v uh, so this is all uh, possible players. You sum the utilities of all possible or payoffs of all possible players for all pure strategies and it should be equal to zero. Okay, so this definition is very much similar to the definition of a zero sum game for n players as well as for two players. Okay. So even though I've introduced it in the context of mixed strategies, you know what pure strategy would look like, right? EI and E minus I. So that zero sum, then you have pairwise constant sum, which essentially means that A I J plus A J I transpose is equal to zero. Okay, so if A i j is an R m i cross m j, then A j i is an R m j 
cross Mi. And then you take the transpose of this. You add the two, sorry, it's constant sum, so it should it should add up to a constant, a constant matrix. Okay, so that's a constant sum game. Uh, we know from our experience that if you have pairwise, well, we don't know from experience, but uh, for two player case, a constant sum game is strategically equivalent to a zero sum game, right? Uh, we'll not prove, but I will mention a similar result holds for uh, polymot polymatrix games as well. And what else? We have the general non zero sum game. Non zero sum. Okay. Okay. So having uh, introduced the model, now I want to uh, I want to talk about what the goal, what the scope of this class is. So we have two goals. So the first is a numerical method for zero sum game. The second goal is a reduction proving not, we won't prove it, but I'll tell you how these two games are related, so a relation between zero sum and pairwise constant sum games. And the third is approximate or epsilon Nash computation of non zero sum. Okay. Okay, so those are the three topics that we will talk about in today's uh, today's class. Any questions so far? Okay. So the first result is I want to come up with a numerical method for zero sum game. So remember Lemke Hausen gives us a numerical method for uh, solving a non zero sum game. So so, so Lemke Hausen uh, algorithm gives us how to solve a non zero sum game but the maximization problem can be used to solve a zero sum game. So let's recall what the maximization problem was. I want to maximize pi 1 plus pi 2 uh, <coughs> is it maximize or minimize it? I think it's maximize. Does anyone remember whether it was maximization? No? Okay. Anyways, let me write, write it A a, a q less than equal to pi 1 and minus a transpose p less than equal to pi 2. Maybe it was minimization, but then a was a cost matrix for player 1. p q pi 1 pi 2. So I don't know the the algorithm looks something like this, okay? There might be a minimization or maximization. Uh, but for two player, zero sum game, this is exactly what the algorithm is. It turns out that a slight, I mean, it's the, the algorithm for uh, polymatrix game is exactly, uh, exactly similar to this. So that is 
uh, min summation of pi i i equals 1 to n or i in v and this minimization is with respect to p1 to pn and pi 1 to pi n subject to pi i u i a i p minus i for all a i in 1 to m i. Okay, so that's exactly similar to this particular expression. In fact, I think it is, I mean, if you look at this expression, it looks like this is also minimum of pi 1 plus pi 2. Okay, so the theorem is this uh, p 1 star p n star pi 1 star pi n star optimal if and only if p 1 star to p n star is Nash equilibrium. And of course, pi 1 star and all the way up to pi n star are equilibrium uh, values that players are going to receive. Okay, and this result was proven in 2016. Okay, so if you have a setting where, remember that, that zero sum game models adversarial situations, so one person's payoff is other person's loss. So in this case, it's an adversarial situation, but there are multiple players, okay? And the payoff gets divided in a very specific fashion, in a pairwise fashion, because it's this, this polymatrix game models pairwise interaction. So in this case, the payoff gets divided in a in a very specific fashion where the payoff gets divided over every edge. So if the sum of total payoffs is equal to zero, which means that there is no money flowing into the system and there is no money flowing out of the system, okay, so everybody's payoff just adds up to zero. In that case, there exists a linear program, which if you can solve, leads to the Nash equilibrium of this particular zero sum polymatrix game, okay. So I don't know which situations you can, probably some of your research might think of, might uh, study situations where there's no, nothing going out of the system and nothing entering this system. And then you can potentially uh, model it as a polymatrix game and you can have a solution using this linear programming method. Now, one thing that you would recall from our study of this two-player zero-sum game. So we had very nice properties. One thing, one property of two-player zero-sum game is that the value is same for the players, right? Uh, no matter which, no matter which saddle point equilibrium you consider, you get the same value in expected sets. So does that property hold for the zero-sum game, for the zero-sum polymatrix game? Well, it turns out that that's not the case, okay? so. So the differences, well, properties 
you can construct examples so construct rather can <coughs> construct examples to show that value is not unique okay so the values of two different so values for each player for two different equilibrium might be completely different and remember you use this idea for two person zero sum game you use this idea that value is the same use that idea to prove ordered interchangeability property right you, you've done that as part of your assignment uh, it turns out that that doesn't hold so since value is not unique there is no ordered interchangeability property the third feature is the set of nash equilibria is not convex okay that was another thing that you you had proved this so because of ordered interchangeability property you had also proved that the set of nash equilibrium is convex for two person zero sum game but for poly matrix zero sum game that's not the case okay so we lose a lot of properties lots of lot of desirable properties of zero sum games when you consider the poly matrix version of zero sum games okay any question about that no yeah so uh, that's a good question so poly matrix game was defined in 1972 Nine, well, ni not 1972, but sometime before 1972. Okay, and actually, uh, Hausen, Lemke, Hausen, Hausen. So Hausen actually studied this game back at that time. But I guess uh, there was a lack of uh, both lack of computational methods as well as lack of uh, real uh, applications that probably uh, was the reason why nobody thought of this. Uh, this algorithm since 1972 i guess that that's what my hunch would be okay uh now the second part which is to show that these two games so every zero sum game so one thing that you know is pairwise constant sum game can be converted into a zero sum game by removing the constant from every pairwise interaction okay all of us understand that uh but can you do the opposite which means if you have a zero sum game which in which all the payoffs add up to zero can you come up with a pairwise constant sum game uh which is uh which has the same set of nash equilibrium as the original zero sum game it turns out that yes you can do that and here is a construction so that's the next next result so that's theorem 2 so we know that uh, so one is the fact we can easily convert pair wise constant sum <coughs> game to zero sum okay uh, without changing the the set of nash equilibrium okay so the two games will be strategically equivalent can we do the opposite it turns out that yes so so the other fact is 
we can convert zero sum game to pairwise constant sum game. Consider my a hat i j a i a j equals a i j one comma a j Okay, so this is uh, this is comes from zero sum game, and this gives you the payoff matrix of constant pairwise constant sum game. Okay, and if you go through this reduction, you can actually prove that the original zero sum game, where the sum of all utilities was equal to zero actually transforms into a pairwise constant sum game where individual uh, two individual uh, so uh, if you add a hat i so what do i mean by this a hat i j plus a hat I j i transpose is equal to constant constant uh, matrix okay so that's what I mean so it becomes a pairwise constant sum game uh, one thing that I'm not able to find is whether fictitious play would converge in a pairwise constant sum game or not okay so that's something that some of you might want to study uh, and I guess those of you who are very much interested in probability theory can probably try to prove it or disprove it using Martingale, uh, using the theory of Martingale. Um, that probably is the only way to prove that fictitious play may or may not converge in this pairwise constant sum game. The other way to show, to, to prove that fictitious play would converge is to show that it has some potential function. Okay, in which case fictitious play would converge. So I don't know what method might be useful to proving that fictitious play would converge or not. In fact, I don't even know whether any paper has been written. I did some quick search and I couldn't find any paper. So that may be a problem uh, one could work on in the future. Any question on this second part? Okay. So in some sense, these two games are equivalent equivalent classes of games okay now the second thing that you should know is that in order to check whether a game is pairwise constant sum or not it's fairly easy okay um, so so that could give you also a quick algorithm to check whether a game a game that has been presented to you perhaps it's a very large scale game if that is presented to you whether it's a zero sum game or not Yeah. Make it a zero sum. How will you? I see what you are suggesting, but unless the other player has constant matrices with every player it might not work out if the the payoff matrices has to be constant with respect to every player which doesn't make any sense i mean that leads gives gets you back to this constant sum game uh, that's a very good point uh, but i don't think it will work because 
if it doesn't work for a simple, no, 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 I shouldn't say that. Yeah. Uh, what I was trying to say is if it doesn't work for a general n player non zero sum game, then it won't work for polymatrix game. But then polymatrix has a lot of structure which is not there in a general non zero sum game. But I don't think it will it'll work out. Yeah. See, here is here is the issue. Let's say in order to make the total payoff equal to zero, you were able to come up with some matrices and another player so that each player has that matrix with every other player so in some sense that player is completely connected to all other players then it becomes a zero sum game okay let's think about it so i added a i k plus u i p i p minus i right and k is the new player and so the total payoff would be p i transpose a i k p k plus this okay and i use this this uh, whatever the algorithm was i used that to compute p i star and p minus i star and p k star then I still need to prove that this part, so let's say I found star. I need to prove that this is greater than or equal to pi star transpose a i k p k star. So to prove plus u i p i p minus i star okay so i'm having trouble having different values in this point and in this point okay so if this is true let's say i am able to prove this then i can delete this and i can prove that p i star and p minus star i star are still in equilibrium in the old game but somehow that's not what i get here But that's a good thought. Maybe you can carve out a small set of non-zero sum game that can be solved in this fashion, who knows. Okay. Any other question? No? Okay, so. So we proved that a LP can solve zero sum game. We proved that there is some sort of equivalence between these two games. Now let's look at non-zero sum game and some approximation method for computing approximate Nash equilibrium. So epsilon Nash equilibrium in polymatrix games. So again, I want to go back to our discussion, uh, our discussion uh, towards the end of uh, end of October, when we were trying to talk, when we were talking about uh, a epsilon Nash equilibrium for general bimatrix game. So we had this result for uh, two player two player by matrix game a comma b okay and we assume that the the entries of a i j not i j i want to use something else i j Sorry, K L. Uh, no, K is already used as a player index. U V. Okay. No, U is already used. A. No. A. A one. A two is less than equal to one. And B. A one. A two. Is less than equal to one. Okay. So in some sense, the entries of the matrices are bounded. 
Okay, so for this, we had proved this result, or rather, uh, let's consider <coughs> delta uh, so remember what the general methodology was. We, we want to find P star or P epsilon star in delta M and Q epsilon star in delta N. And this set is huge. Okay, It has a lot of points in, in, in the simplex. So what we would do is we pick some specific points. And then what we do is we prove that there exists an equilibrium, epsilon Nash equilibrium among these specific points. And let's do an exhaustive search over every such point and check for epsilon Nash condition. <coughs> so we define what is known as K uniform strategy, which is essentially your P epsilon or rather P in delta M such that P is equal to not A, uh, S, yeah, that's good. Alpha 1 over K, alpha M over K, okay, where alpha 1 to alpha M are uh, positive integers. Okay, or rather greater than or equal to zero. Okay, non negative integers. <coughs> okay, and one of the main results was if you restrict yourself to this this class of strategies, both for player one as well as player 2, then the main result was, or one of the main results was, this comes from Lipton et L 2003, the theorem is If k is greater than equal to 12 log m or rather max of m comma n over epsilon square, then there exists epsilon Nash equilibrium p star epsilon q star epsilon in uh, delta mk cross delta nk. Okay. So that actually uh, this this method is perhaps one of the few methods to provably compute epsilon Nash equilibrium. Uh, there are some variations of this method, of course, which we, which we talked about in the class. But this is the main idea, which is to, instead of looking at the entire set, look at a much smaller subset, which you can enumerate by hand, and then go through each of those points and check for epsilon Nashness. And, if, and, there, and this theorem, guarantees that there will be an epsilon Nash equilibrium within that restricted set. Okay, So that was the theorem in, back in 2003. So we are going to use the same idea in general non-zero sum polymatrix game as well. Okay, So any question about this, about this theorem? This is something we have already studied in the end of October. So now I have multiplayer, n player, polymatrix game n player 
M action polymatrix game. And this result is from Babichenko twenty fourteen. Okay, and what's the result? There exist if k is greater than or equal to 8 log n log m plus log n minus log epsilon plus log 8 over epsilon square. Then there exists epsilon Nash equilibrium P1 epsilon Pn epsilon star in delta delta 1k cross delta nk. Okay, and how would you search for epsilon Nash? Uh, search by enumeration. So it might take you several years to find an equilibrium if you enumerate a very large number of players, uh, but that's the main result for a general non zero sum polymatrix game. Okay, uh, how do you get these kind of inequalities? Well, you use concentration of measures in some fashion. Okay, uh, and uh, and then you get some of those inequalities. Uh, so that's all I have for polymatrix game. It's still an evolving field. Maybe some of you will contribute to this particular field. Some of you might even contribute to the applications of polymatrix games. Uh, one could potentially think of infinite number of players, but with a very small subset, like with a constant degree. So you have a large graph, but with a constant degree, and you have payoff matrices of some type. How do you characterize an equilibrium? Um, so that's something you can study, uh, or, or you could come up with more different structures for specific application that can be useful for uh, understanding uh, some natural engineering systems. So, uh, so that's so. My main main motivation was to provoke some new thoughts and ideas of applications of polymatrix game and the setting that is uh, that is being studied right now in computer science literature, and come up with your own applications and theory about these games. Okay. So. So, so this is the second last class. The last class would be on models of bounded rationality. And, and I, I somehow feel that the models of bounded rationality is the most important part of game theory and I've sort of kept it for the final, final day. So I want to motivate the discussion since I have about half an hour right now uh, and the class is already over. So let me motivate the discussion about Bounded rationality, what does it mean to have bounded rationality? So one of the underlying ideas in game theory so far is that if I am a player in a game, I can do all this computation, Nash equilibrium computation in my head. Okay, I can figure out what the optimal strategy should be and I, should, I would behave according to that optimal strategy. And and if I'm in a dynamic setting, which is, you know, almost all of us are in a dynamic setting. We are not never playing a static game, okay? 
uh, we are all in a dynamic setting. So if I take an action today, I can dedu deduce from my action or from what I, how I'm going to behave, I can deduce infinite deductions about how you are going to behave, how others are going to behave, what's the effect of those actions on me, on my future self is going to be and so on. Okay, so there is an infinite deduction that goes on uh, when you are talking about acting in a dynamic game. Okay, but I know, we, we all know from our personal experience that that is not the case. When I think about taking an action today, I'm not able to think through everything completely. Okay, so that's the underlying idea of bounded rationality. Okay. Okay, so rationality is being able to do infinite amount of optimization in a very, in a fraction of a second. Okay, and we know that we cannot do that. Bounded rationality means I have limited computational power and I really mean brain computational power. So I have limited brain computational power. I have limited information processing capabilities. Okay, if I read a news article, it's not like I remember everything for the rest of my life. Okay, I forget most of the things. So bounded means limited computational, limited information processing capabilities and limited storage capability. Okay, so it it's a sum of all those three boundedness that uh, specifies every human being. Okay, so how do we adapt the models in game theory so as to emphasize about the fact that we are all bounded rational creatures. We don't have infinite rationality. Okay, so how do we change the model? To give you an example of uh, uh, yeah, to give you an example of bounded rationality, uh, how many of you know uh, about the casino in Columbus? Okay, gambling. Okay, many people. Okay, some of them, these are, you know, poor graduate students who don't know about casino. <laughs> but as soon as they become rich, they will know about it. Hollywood, Hollywood casino, right? So you are rich. <laughs> yeah. So there is a casino in Columbus. It almost feels like Vegas as soon as you enter that casino. Okay, so you don't have to go to Vegas to enjoy Vegas. Okay, you can just drive 10 miles and you will enjoy Vegas here right in Columbus. Okay, so there is a casino, right? Uh, and whenever you go to casino, you will see a lot of people playing slot machines. Okay, just, just insane number of people playing slot machines. Why, why do people play slot machines? Okay, if you think about it, why do people play lottery? Let's say with probability P1, you're going to get a reward R. But with probability P2, you are going to lose whatever, $10. Let's say you put $10 in the slot machine. Let's say this reward is $1,000. Okay, so with a small probability, you will win a thousand dollars. With very, with very high probability, you will lose almost surely lose your ten dollars. Okay, if you do the math for casinos, it turns out that P1 would be of the order of ten raised to minus six. Okay, or maybe ten raised to minus five. So this is the expected payoff that you are getting, okay? And the expected payoff is almost minus 10, okay? So in some sense, everyone who's sitting there has gone there to lose money, okay? They've not gone there to win a reward of $1,000. But why do people play in casino? Okay, that's because they have bounded rationality. They are not, so this is your expected, expected, payoff, okay? This is the expected payoff, and what people are doing is not maximizing their expected payoff, but they are maximizing something else, okay? Because if they were maximizing expected payoff, they would have decided not to go to casino, and they would have saved this $10, okay, that they lost. So in 
reality humans maximize something else okay humans maximize something else it's not the expected payoff and that something else will be called prospect and i will introduce prospect theory in the next class so that's one part that's uh, It's not probability of being rich. Uh, uh, it is distorting the probability in your favor. Okay. Uh, what do I mean by that? <coughs> Even though this P1 is 10 raised to minus 5, as soon as I enter casino, I feel that this probability P1 is actually 0 0.1. So I've distorted the entire probability. I've distorted the real chances of actually losing. And then suddenly it becomes extremely wise for me to go and actually play on the slot machines because I'm feeling lucky that day, okay? <laughs> so I'm distorting the probability. And then if I maximize my expected payoff, it's, everything feels very nice, okay? Everything works out because my expected payoff is going to be $90 instead of minus $10. So I'll talk about the foundations, well, not really the mathematical foundation, even though there is a mathematical and axiomatic characterization of prospect theory. I won't talk about that, but I'll talk about what the model of prospect theory is. But in some sense, prospect theory tries to distort the probability distribution itself so that things look good in your favor, okay? Um, so that's one, that's one, uh, one way by which humans exhibit uh, bounded rationality. So instead of being, uh, instead of maximizing the expected payoff or minimizing the expected cost, we compute what is known as prospects and then we try to maximize prospect, okay? Based on our risk seeking or risk uh, averse attitude. So his question is whether it is related to transferable utility. Uh, uh, I don't think so, you know, because when you go into casino, you don't think of yourself and casino in a cooperative game where you are giving ten dollars to the casino, uh, or maybe you are. Maybe it's a service of casino that you are using. Okay, and so you feel good about it and you pay. Let's say you go for a massage, you give them $100 and they give you a massage, okay? So it's a service for which you are paying. You go to a casino, it, it has some feel good factor associated with it and so you give $10 to the casino. Maybe you can think of it as that way, uh, but the way, psycho the way uh, psychologists or people who study psychology, they think of it as uh, in, in, this, in this particular fashion where you're distorting the probability itself in order to make that, in order to make that decision or make that choice. Uh, the other idea of bounded rationality is I receive some information, but I don't, I'm not able to store all that information in my brain. So in some way I am, so I observe X, which is a random variable distributed according to pi. But when I actually store it in my brain, I actually store it as Y, which has some other distribution, nu. Okay? And somehow this nu and pi has to be related. So one way to relate them is through, uh, through Shannon capacity. Okay? So the mutual information between X and Y has to be bounded by the capacity of the channel between the information source and my brain, okay, whatever that capacity is. If you can store and process a lot of information, your capacity is too high, you can absorb a lot more information. Uh, if your capacity is low, it means you cannot really store a lot of information in your brain. So that's another model of bounded rationality, which alludes to the information processing capabilities of human beings, okay? So that's another model that we will talk about. 
Uh, there aren't many, or maybe there are some theoretical results in this area, but it will be more of human psychology and some economics and psychology literature, an overview of those literature, which deals with this topic of bounded rationality. <coughs> okay. The other issue of bounded rationality is seen in insurance. Okay. Why do we take insurance? The probability of me dying next year is very, very low. Okay. But I still have insurance. Uh, because I'm not really maximizing the expected payoff, I'm somehow minimizing the risks associated with me dying in the next one year. Okay, so um, in fact, I, in fact, this year, the Ohio State University and myself uh, together, we have paid about thirteen thousand dollars to my insurance company, but I haven't received any medical service. Okay, so in some sense, <laughs> you know. I paid $13,000 for something for which I didn't receive anything, right? And this is going to go on for many, many years, okay, before I actually start using medical services to the extent that I use the entire $13,000 that I'm paying to the insurance company. But I'm doing all of that in order to uh, not minimize my payoff or maximize my payoff, but maximize prospects, okay? Just in case if I get into an accident today, Who's going to pay for 30, 40, 50 thousands of bills? Okay, I don't want to suddenly get a bill which is $50,000 and my leg is broken and my, I'm in the hospital. Okay, that's not a good thing to happen. So that's why I, I, I feel at the starting of the year, here is my 13,000, take it, okay, and just insure me for the rest of the year. Okay, so that's, uh, that's really where I'm headed towards when I talk about bounded rationality. It's not going to be a technical class, okay. All right, thank you.